The difference between having a great quarter, making your number, or reporting a bad quarter often comes down to the effectiveness of your sales team's discovery calls and demos. But how do you make sure your reps are doing the right things on their calls in order to finish the quarter strong? Well, introducing Gong.io, the number one conversation intelligence platform for B2B sales teams. Gong helps you ensure your reps are doing deep discovery calls and crisp sales demos by recording, transcribing, and analyzing their calls. And Gong allows you to understand how well your playbook is being followed and analyze how well it's working so you can constantly move the needle on your win rates. Now, if you request a demo of Gong as a result of hearing this message, you'll get a free ebook copy of my award-winning book, Zero Time Selling, 10 Essential Steps to Accelerate Every Company's Sales. So go to gong.io forward slash accelerate to request your no-obligation demo and get your copy of my award-winning book, Zero Time Selling. Again, that's gong.io forward slash accelerate, G-O-N-G dot I-O forward slash accelerate. So go there now and come back and enjoy today's episode. It's time to accelerate. Hey, friends, this is Andy. Welcome to episode 529 of Accelerate. Yeah, 529 episodes of the sales podcast of record, where I hold in depth conversations with today's leading experts in sales, marketing, and leadership six days a week. Joining me today on the show for the second time is Kyle Porter. Kyle's the CEO and founder of Sales Loft. I really enjoyed speaking with Kyle because he's one of the more thoughtful people I've encountered in sales in the last couple of years. And today we're going to talk about the future of selling, how technology, primarily in the form of artificial intelligence or AI, will have an impact on sellers and what it will mean for you. Now, before we get to Kyle, let me remind you that today's show is brought to you in part by our friends at Gong.io. Gong analyzes your sales calls and demos so you can understand what's working and what's not. It's a great coaching tool to help managers boost sales rep productivity. So check it out at gong.io forward slash accelerate. And if you do that today, you get a free PDF copy of my award-winning book, Zero Time Selling. If you'd like to see the show notes for this episode, go to andypaul.com forward slash 529. We'll provide you there a timestamp breakdown of this and all the conversations on Accelerate. All right, let's jump into it with Kyle. Kyle Porter, welcome to Accelerate. Glad to be here, Andy. Thanks for having me. Uh, I should have said welcome back. So it's glad to have you back again. So here's a standard question I ask my guests at the start of the show now is, is, in your opinion, what's the single biggest challenge facing sales reps today? I think it's distraction. There's so many things going on, so many books, advice, lessons, things on the internet, uh, you know, people influencing them. I think I think they're just distracted too often from the mission and the point and what's most important to them. Wow. So how do we how do we solve that? Because other than making sure they only listen to this sales podcast. <laughs> other than that, what's what's in your mind? How how do you help the sales professional uh, with I that? Think, I think they need to protect their time. It's okay to engage in lots of things that that add value, but it's it's they need to be careful that they don't sway their decisions too frequently. Uh, You need to put a sales process in place and execute on top of it for a period of time before you can tell what you need to tweak to make better, before you can tell what what works really well and what doesn't. And so I think it's just this idea that, you know, uh, you know, set up a plan, stick to the plan and then improve iteratively, but be careful not to uh, you know, always allow for yourself to be distracted for the next new shiny object. And there's just more shiny objects today than there's ever been before. True. I mean, it's part of that, that they need to, I know this is, this is sort of an open-ended question, but is, is they need to be able to know what they stand for. I mean, to me, it's, I see that with, with newer reps in particular is, you know, part of the thing, they're always, always reaching for that, you know, that edge, quote unquote edge, because, they haven't really developed a, a belief or philosophy in themselves. Yeah, I think another one is is trusting leadership as well. You know, if you've got a great team that's executing and performing and doing awesome, and they've got processes and plans in place, and you join, it's you know a lot of people kind of want to buck the system and go their own way, but you know it might be really the best interest of the seller and the organization if you start off by believing in the company and believing in their approach and believing in their process and then add your tweaks over time. So I think that's an angle to look at it at, at from as well. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because that's, that's, that's a big topic with me because I, I see in my work, I, I see too many reps when I feel when they get to that point where they should be 
adding their individuality to it and, and emphasizing their strengths, they're not. They're still just sort of mindlessly conforming to the process. And and I think that sometimes organizations rob themselves of upside by not not giving people some latitude in that regard. Yeah, and I think a lot of organizations don't have it figured out as well. So, you know, if you, you come join us an organization and they don't have their process down, they don't have the rigor, the routine, the the plans in place, then you're going to have to search immediately for your own own way. Um, or, but, you know, but then flip side is if they think they've got it and they've indoctrinated it, then, you know, folks might be too stuck to it. But I, I actually see the other one more, but I can see them both happening. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. All right. Well, one of the things we want to talk about on the show today is um, sales and, and AI. I mean, because this is, this is, I don't want to say it's it's a buzzword, but it's it's coming. It's it's happening. We see applications out there already, and you know, with a lot of sales audiences, just saying the word AI, you know, sends a shiver of fear down their spine because they first thing they do is sort of project forward and say, "Great, they're trying to replace me." Uh, but that's, I guess, that's not really when I talk to more and more people. It's not really what's happening. I mean, what what do you see happening with AI that's that's significant in sales? Well, I want to start by combating that notion that AI is going to replace salespeople. I think the irony of great AI is that it makes us more human and that it allows us to connect in more human ways. So sure, if you're on a, you know, a, a, a car assembly line and you put in a new machine that takes out a human process, that's, that's replacement. Uh, but in the sales process, you can't really replace, you can't at all replace the human to human interaction and the connectivity of authenticity and sincerity and understanding that goes into sales. You know, people will buy from people they know and trust. And, and sure, you, know, you might buy some transactional things on the web or without talking to many people. And, you know, that might even reach its way all the way up to a car that has a set level sure. of specifications and you can understand all the things for it. But, uh, you know, really what I think that AI does is it frees us up. It does the manual, tedious labor so that we can do the things in sales that matter the most to us, which is connect and spend engaged time with our buyers. So give me an example or give the audience an example of what you mean is, is what AI will, in your mind, how AI will best benefit sales, you know, doing the repetitive tasks and so on you talk about. Well, I think we got to be careful. You know, there's, when you start talking about machine learning, you start talking about natural language processing, artificial intelligence, uh, you know, we're, we're, th- there's some things that kind of quantitate that as, as in that category. And there's some things that are just process automations. So, for example, if you're using a product like our product, like SalesLoft, and you're making phone calls and sending emails and the system is automatically logging that back to the CRM, that's not considered artificial intelligence. But it is take it is, you know, taking away some of the tedious work that you're already doing and letting robots do it on your behalf. Right. So that's a that's an example. But now where it would get into it is when you start analyzing the conversation or analyzing the email content and making decisions based on it, you know, surfacing up the right next contact to reach out to based on lots of data. Right. So there's a lot of things that, you know, we just need to be careful around those terms of when we kind of cross over to them. But I think kind of, you know, what's really smart is just bucket it all into the idea that, you know, removal or automation of this thing that salespeople once did and use robots to do it. And I think that's where, where it makes most sense to talk about on a sales level. Uh, but yeah, entering things into Salesforce, um, you know, deciding who to call next, deciding, you know, remembering whether you said you were going to call this person back and when, and now you've got that stacked across all 300 accounts that you're managing. And so knowing exactly what to do when, I think that's really where we start talking about uh, machines automating the process that sellers uh, didn't want to do or forgot to do or, or, you know, even didn't do, but they should have. Well, one of the things you mentioned there was was a little more, I don't know, analytic, predictive based, which was telling someone who to call next. Yeah, there's assumed that there's some sort of logic and computation and calculation behind that that says, yeah, we've prioritized this. Is I mean, we see some of that already. I think you you probably already do that some degree within Salesoft, right? Well, yeah. I mean, what what we're doing right now is we're we're taking the things that salespeople are doing today, and we're using a lot of advancements of technology to accelerate that, to remove the barriers, to make it easier on them. Uh, so that if they're, you know, they, they want to manage a large list of accounts right now today, you know, most organizations, salespeople, they're not able to reach out to all the accounts that they should be managing. But with a product like SalesLoft, 
you put together the prescription of how you want to contact them, how many emails, how many phone calls over what days. If they say this, then you want to, you know, they say this and you want to call them back in two months. You can program and prescribe all that in the system. So then it allows you to execute on all those touch points. And what happens is, is by following the right process, by following the right go to market, that's that it's really your go to market just codified in a platform. It enables the seller to connect with the buyer better, spend more engaged time with them, drive more pipeline, ultimately leading to more revenue. So we're doing a lot of these automations to help speed up these go to markets. Uh, but the biggest one is just holding them to the things that they want to do and holding them accountable to the steps they want to take uh, that they're either not able to today because they've got too many barriers or too many routine tasks and you know, tedious tasks in the way. Yeah, I mean, somebody I was just speaking with used the term that that part of what we're seeing with with the sort of AI and the the uh, removal of some of the repetitive processes and sales reps is so I used the term sort of the mechanization of of sales. Yeah, I like that. You know, one of the things that I, I talk about is um, you know most organizations have this set way that they believe is best to connect with their buyers, whether it's their mid market account selling the financial services. They know if we get the CIO of a FinServe company in this size sector and we reach them with this messaging at this time and call them this many times or this many days, they know all those things kind of deep in their process. But the difference between how their sales strategy and their sales actual implementation, there's a big, big gap there. And so what these solutions are doing is they're saying, hey, let's codify that in the system, hold the team accountable and then measure the success of it and then tweak and improve over time based on the outcomes. So I think that's the, that's the way to look at it. And I think that mechanization is a great word. Orchestration is another word sure. uh, that works really well in this, this scenario. Uh, you know, we use the word cadence to describe that process. Uh, but I, I like it. I like mechanization a lot. So, but somewhere in there still, and this is one of the things that when I asked the question about, you know, the value where AI might come in is, is saying, okay, we've got all these interactions that are taking place. But to your point earlier, at some point, a person's talking to a person. Yeah, That's how, right. how do we how do we measure the effectiveness of that, right? I mean, because it's such an individual thing. Because people are such individuals, and how they, ex- you know, part of what you're seeing with AI, and there's some companies coming out with apps that's saying, look, you know, we can, you know, uh, real time transcribe calls. We can, you know, put together a playbook that's very solid of what the A players do, and you know, hey, so here's something for the B players and C players to roll out and roll into, but but. At the end of the day, though, is is there's still such nuance, individual nuance, and in how an individual sells is how does how does AI capture that to be able to help, you know, your middle class sales, your middle seventy percent? How do you help them really become better? Well, I, you know, I'd like to address that, but you know, I'd like to start by talking about the fact that most salespeople aren't spending the majority of their time even connecting with the buyer in the first place. Sure, right? There's Absolutely. study after study that says that reps spend 60 to 70% of their time not actually selling. Right. And so if you can double the amount, you know, if you could, if you could flip that and say that, okay, now they are spending 65% of their time actually selling. So now you have a lot more bats, you have a lot more opportunity to improve. And if, if you know, all else being equal, give me more time and I'm going to do you know, more time with more people and you're going to do a better job. So I think before you even start to get into this effectiveness question is, you know, how can we get more time with them? Because more time is going to equal more, you know, an improved way of going about it in the first place. Now, once you have that more time, uh, there's definitely, I mean, there's results, right? Did you get the thing that you wanted to get out of it? And, uh, and that's the ultimate goal. Uh, but yeah, I've seen, I've seen a lot of really neat things where you're, you know, uh, uh, our customers are recording many of their conversations as long as it's, as it's in compliance with the law. And then what they'll do is they'll create checklists of things that need to happen on those conversations and the manager will score those conversations. And you can use many of the new uh, third party kind of uh, call call analysis and review software that's out in the marketplace. And I'm sure you're aware mm-hmm, of mm-hmm. And uh, you know, that's really neat stuff. And, and you can you know put it on 1.5 speed and listen through and make sure they ask the right questions. And what I've seen is great managers, they have these scorecards and these checklists and they're checking them off and they're scoring a number of calls each day or each week, and they're able to tell, hey, here's how effective someone's been. Now, the future state, the AI state of this is understanding the context of those conversations, knowing that when the rep talks less than the buyer, that's typically a good thing. Or maybe it's not in this scenario based on you know previous factors we've right. seen, but, but oftentimes it is, right? And we know that if the 
customer mentions the words, uh, you know, pricing a number of times, maybe at the first call, that's a good thing, or maybe it's a bad thing. It's a lot at the last call, but AI would know based on having experienced these things and tying them up with the ultimate outcome. But of course, this is, you know, some future thinking. I think the best way to look at it is it's not, you know, back to kind of your first point, AI sales is not replacing the salesperson. It's becoming the salesperson's assistant. Yeah, I think it's a good way to, to look at it. And, and to that point, though, and you so you raised an interesting question, which is, and one that, that I discuss with a lot of guests on the show and, and think a lot about is, is, yeah, we have this issue, you talk about statistics, study after study show that, you know, sales reps are spending 35, 30, 35% of their time actually engaged with, with buyers. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, is, and, but that's, that's, I mean, that's been a long time. It's been that way. Right. So, and we haven't really seen the needle move a, a lot on that. So is that, are we better off trying to spend time trying to free up more time for the reps that way or deal with the effectiveness issue? I know well, it's I not, it's, I know it's not an either or, but I mean, just think in terms of how, what's the best use of our technology investments that we're making to try to really actually move the needle. Well, let me ask you a question. You're a, a big cyclist and I know you did a 50 mile ride just recently. <laughs> Could you have done that the first time you rode your bike? No. But repetition after repetition, sure. practice after practice, practice right. shot after shot after shot, right? Like I can get on a wakeboard and flip up in the air, but I couldn't do it the first few times, you know, the first hundred times I rode a wakeboard. Uh, so repetition gives us an opportunity to get better and better and better. And I think what's happening is salespeople aren't even getting the at-bats that they need today. And so this is an opportunity to give them more at-bats, then of course, train them and Make sure they're educated. Make sure they understand, uh, you know, the, the things that move deals forward, and that they're measured on the back end to know what was successful and what wasn't, and do things like call coaching scorecards. So I think, you know, it is both of those things. Is you need you need to get on your bike, and then you need to read the book on how to get better, right? And then you need to practice it, and then you need to see how your practice, you know, worked, and and then you know do that as a looping system. So think of it as as all one kind of process for going out there and 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 making it happen. I think. I think, you know, the, the flip side of the repetition is when I first got a wakeboard, I remember I was uh, 18 years old and I would ride this thing and, and, uh, and I was doing one trick. Th- I thought only this one trick was the trick that I understood until I bought a, and at the time an actual VHS and watched it. And this guy taught me all these things that I didn't know. And I went out and practiced them over and over again. So, so it's a little bit of both for sure. Or a lot of both. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. I mean, training, education, really important, but, um, yeah, and it's sort of a typical SDR. I mean, let's take your your company for instance. I mean, your SDR teams, your AEs, you, they're not getting enough repetitions. Well, ours are different. You know, if, if Gartner came in and did a study of the total sales industry and found that only thirty five percent of our time, their, the industry's time was spent selling, they'd find a lot higher percent at sales loft mm. because we build a product made to increase the amount of selling, time <laughs> you have, and we better be damn good at it. You know, right? So, so we've been we totally indoctrinated this process to connect with our buyers in better ways. Sure. But I mean, just in general, if you were to look, let's say, in the, the B2B tech space, right, where a lot of you, I think that's the heaviest concentration of your your customers are, is, are they are they using the tool the way they should in order to increase the repetitions? Well, yeah. I mean, our, our customers are putting this thing to work. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting because, uh, you know, a platform like a sales engagement product like SalesLock, there's so many things it can do. Uh, but you don't have to, you don't have to adopt all the wizards and features and, you know, all the things it does in order to get significant results, right? You put in a process where your team members know to, you know, know when to make the phone calls and how many to make and who to contact over time. And it's the difference between being able to keep up with 15 accounts on a weekly basis or a monthly basis and being able to keep up with 400 accounts Mm -hmm. on a monthly basis. Mm -hmm. And it, and it doesn't have to sacrifice the sincerity of it, you know, because that's the thing that, you know, that I, I, when I got into this industry, that was what we were fighting against was people sending marketing automation spam to their accounts and thinking they were selling. And the right. idea is, is that we want to create an opportunity where we can personalize, be sincere, understand the buyer better, but also add that to this process that scales up the ability to connect with them. And so it's kind of this, it's this concept of balancing sincerity the human side, the empathetic side, the understanding, the honest, the you know all, all the things that make us connect with one one another, with the science side of repeatability, scalability, 
you know, process. When you put those things together, you can make amazing things happen. And, and that's what our customers have been doing. And, and it's just been really incredible. And I think, you know, that, that's part of what's happening in this industry, right? If you go back a couple of years ago, there started to be this time where marketing organizations wouldn't go without having their own system of record. Right. And that system of record was marketing automation. And, uh, and, and CRM is not for the user. It's not for the actual seller, the communicator, the, the one that's engaged with the buyer. It's been for management and it's this right. layer of data coordination. It's actually become the, the kind of the, the ERP of the enterprise. Um, but what we're doing and other companies in this space, of course, uh, are creating this must have uh, application of record for the sales engine. And that's what's happening. That's what we're seeing. And it's, it's really been fun. And that's why you see the growth that we've we've experienced in other companies in our space. Sure. Well, it seems like to me that that whole personalization aspect seems like that would be a, just ripe for the use of AI, right? As you know, you've got a, a bot out there that's tracking the customer in a much more nuanced way, just not sort of a bulk, you know, hey, Google Alerts type way. But, you know, what really, was that last word? <laughs> not in sort of a bulk Google Alerts type way, but oh, actually, yeah, you right. know, a more intelligent search of where they're going, what they're visiting, what the triggers might be, you know, news, you know, so on, announcements, so on. And then being able to, help really is that bring that data in to really help personalize the communications. Yeah. And, and we're seeing a little bit of that kind of the entry level of that with products that analyze the prospect or buyer's history on the web and uncover their personality profile, bucket them into a disc, for example, mm-hmm. and then feed back to the rep on ways to interact with folks from that, uh, you know, from that background or, or one idea would be to take your sellers and, understand what type of personalities they best sell to by looking at their historical examples and then line them up with inbound leads as they come in. These are some of the things that we've been working on and, and playing with some of our partners that are doing amazing things in the space. And so, mm. yeah, there's tons of opportunity for this. I think, you know, the big thing is we're really just getting started. And for, for sales leaders who are implementing technology, it's important to, uh, you know, to, to start off with the kind of the crawl, walk, run mentality. Um, you know, if your people don't have enough activities, let's get them enough activities. If you're not calling on the right accounts, let's call on the right accounts. If you don't have the right people at those accounts, let's get that first, right? There's a lot of things you got to do before you start looking at AI driven personality matching to improve the, you know, connection sure, of a sure. seller to a buyer. Um, but it is all coming and it's just a matter of time and it's a matter of, of how well we can get these, um, you know, Get, get to first base with the industry and, you know, kind of round second and we can, you know, fill in the, the you know, the blanks for AI and, and machine learning and natural language processing as, you know, the whole package of creating this new guided selling environment. So back at sort of the one of the topics we talked early on is, is the distraction, the overwhelm and so on. Is, is there a fear that some of the, you know, technology, the AI, AI and so on is, is going to, exacerbate that problem as opposed to helping you know I, you know you hear about applications where you know ai can be feeding prompts to the screen while the, the seller's on the phone with the buyer and so on is you can suddenly imagine that sort of distracting to some degree not as distracting as the facebook from their ex <laughs> well that's true but <laughs> nonetheless i wasn't yeah I, I try not to bring that up because you know, i've got stories and stories about that but <laughs> but but it, it seems like that almost could contribute to the overwhelm as opposed to streamline it. So, yeah, it's you- important that, the, that, the, that what the rep engages with is part of the guided selling experience that's best for your buyer. And, uh, and I think that, that's where we talk about the kind of the crawl, walk, run and the first base thing. Because if you start getting into AI recommendation land right now, but you haven't you know, figured out those other steps, then those recommendations might not be on point. And, uh, you know, the, the guided sell, selling future and really the guided selling environment that we're providing and, and that we're working on, uh, you know, internally and for our customers is, is the rep wakes up and they've got the process baked into their system and they know, hey, it's time to make these calls and here's some messaging to use and here's a way to find out more information. And so they're not taken outside of the purview of my account, of my account universe and the things that that we need to do in order to connect with those accounts, to qualify those accounts and convert those accounts. So I think, you know, when I talk about distraction, it's, it's external to the process things that may make them either not be paying attention to their process 
or think they need to change it. Now, I think with all the technology and all the new systems, uh, sales leadership needs to be very careful to decide the right things that, that uh, you know, won't either give their reps um, the wrong power. And, uh, you know, we've seen so many scenarios where companies wanted to adopt new technology and they bought some system and really what it became was a robo spam, you know, spam sure, machine sure. that just blasted the universe and insincerely connected with or tried to connect with their prospect universe only to burn their brand and hurt the image of that company in the eyes of the buyer. And so uh, sales leadership needs to be vigilant, needs to understand, you know, what technology is real and what's not. And, um, you know, I think Silicon Valley and, and the venture back community has this way of, of um, you know, really promoting the entrepreneur to get out and kind of sell this big dream or story, uh, but be, you know, too many steps behind on the actual implementation of that process or that, of that platform. It happened to us in 2012, way back in the day, sure. you know, I, I went to market and we outsold the things that we were delivering. And at the end of 2012, after basically almost running the company into the ground and burning up my investors' money, burning up my wife's and mine savings that, you know, we had put into the company. And, you know, I got to this point where I said, hey, you know, sales is important, marketing is important, leadership is important. But if you don't have an absolutely amazing platform and technology, if you're in the software business, uh, you're not going to get it done. And so I went out searching for someone who, when I was nine years old, I was selling baseball cards and and Beanie Babies, mm-hmm. and uh, and when my co-founder Rob Foreman was nine years old, he was coding software and bu- you know <laughs> building products, and, and I went out in search of that person because you know I vowed to never let marketing and sales surpass where product was delivering right. on, and uh, and that made the world of difference for us. But you know I think these leaders they are going to be distracted by uh, you know lots of venture capital flow of money. If you if you just take a domain name and add the dot AI on the end of it, you'll get a two X uh, valuation on your Series seed round. <laughs> You know, I mean, that's the way things are going right now. And you just need to be careful around that. And, and uh, you know, the big thing you need to be careful around is is burning up your employees and burning up your uh, target account universe. And those are two things where I'm worried about most for sure. companies out in the industry. Well, yeah, because to the point you made earlier about companies just robo-spamming, using platforms, unfortunately, like yours or others to not with the discipline process, but just to robo-spam uh, you know, a universe of, of potential prospects. And, well, yeah, uh, and, and, and we put some guidelines in place there to make that not as easy, you know, and, and saying, hey, this is a personalization platform. Here's how we're going to do this. Here's how we're going to connect with buyers. And, and uh, you know, and, and I think that's what resonates with a lot of companies out there that are looking to adopt a great technology that allows their people to increase the amount of time they spend engaged with their buyers. So I guess a question that, that I'm always sort of coming back to, especially in the SaaS business, is... So how how do they how does how does how does the industry sort of work on improving their close rates? Because it seems, at least based on the anecdotal evidence I've heard in at conferences and so on, is that it it seems like it's kind of low given the investment we're making in technology, and and it raises a question in my mind at least: is are we applying it in the right way? Yeah, you know, I'm I'm not sure if it's the closing techniques or the selection of that uh, t- of those accounts as the possible target accounts. Mm-hmm. I, I think it's more of a qualification thing. If you look at the industry, salespeople, when, when I got in the industry, uh, we started building all kinds of software for sellers. And what we heard back from buyers was just give me more leads, just give me more leads. I had a different business before what oh, yeah, sales does today. <laughs> yeah, they I were selling lead generation software. Right. And, and quite frankly, what I realized was that Everyone thinks they need more leads, managers and reps alone. Uh, but most of these leads aren't converting at all. And right. so, it's, it, and a lot of times they're not even following up with them the right way. They're not even communicating with them right. Right, the right way. And so I think we've got this issue where, uh, where, you know, people are trying to get, grab the low hanging fruit and, and, um, you know, want to make it easy on them. And, uh, what happens is you don't get the business that you wanted from that. Whereas there's no substitute for hard work, for taking the right leads, qualifying them the right way, communicating them with them in depth and, and, uh, you know, understanding their needs and pains and delivering them solutions that solve those things. And I think we've taken, you know, as an industry, we've taken some, some shortcuts and liberties throughout that process, which might be manifesting itself in this low uh, conversion rate. But I, I, I don't know all the, the statistics on it, but I believe that's the, that's the reason behind it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you brought an interesting point, which is not to go down this this path too far, but but interesting, you you brought it up at all, which was 
you know, that follow up still sucks. Oh yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, th- I think back to the day when I was out making, you know, physically, you know, 30, 40 cold calls a day that having a follow up a tool to help me with follow up, I, mean, I would have killed for, right. Instead of having to manually mem- memorize and, and manage it all. So why do you think that's still an issue? And I, I don't want to make too much of it, but it's, it is sort of a core point still that, that, with all this marvelous technology hitting the marketplace, that we still have these fundamental things just like follow up are problematic. Well, not our customers. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, your serious decision says it, and everyone's heard this stat that it takes eight contacts to connect to somebody, but yet companies are only doing two to three. You know, sellers right. are only making two to three. Right. And, uh, you know, uh, philosophically, uh, you know, when I try to explore why that is, uh, you know, maybe it's the the feeling like there's diminishing returns when you're making that fourth and fifth phone call. Uh, but I think what it really is, is that it's harder to manage all the, the contact points that you want to manage with your target accounts, right? You need a large set of target accounts, depending upon ACVs and, and what sure. you sell where. Uh, but you know, most like at sales Lock, we have the capabilities of our sellers managing 400 accounts and going to market with 400 accounts and not letting leads slip through the crack. Not right. missing the phone call, not missing the emails, because the system's holding them accountable to doing that. They already said that they it, was, sell, it wasn't sales off the idea to hold them accountable. They wanted to do that already. Sure. We just give them something that they then codify that you know makes them stay that way, right? And I think that's that's where you know, there's a lot of beauty in that. It's like you know when I can get to a point where uh, you know like, like I don't have to remember anyone's phone number ever again, and I'm not even going to do it, right? I remember my mom's and my dad, and that's it. Right? I have my phone to do the rest. Mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. Uh, and, but there was a day when people's mental energy and thought process had to be baked in this idea of remembering phone numbers. Right. And I am so glad I don't have to wake up to that life anymore. Right? <laughs> I get to wake up to the life that tells me I don't even have to. I have a calendar. It says all the things I'm going to do today. Right? And for a seller, this is this opportunity to remove this burden on their mind, remove this burden on their heart. And even, I mean, and uh, not to not to stereotype salespeople, but most of the salespeople that I've run into, or many of the salespeople I've run into, they're not the most organized people. They're not the most, you know, they're not, they've got lots of talents, but organization is typically not the top, top talent. And so having a system that says, hey, it's time to make those 40 calls, or hey, here's the person that, you know, told you that uh, they wanted to talk in August or September, and, you know, now the system is teeing it up to go ahead and connect with them. And so I think this is really big for the sales industry because we've been struggling for a long time to keep these things going. And you certainly can't manage them in spreadsheets. You can't manage them in, in Outlook and Google calendars. And you, you definitely can't manage them in those, those uh, Salesforce alerts that pop up and try to tell you all the things you're going to do, right? And so, you know, that's really the, the spawn and the, the um, existence of, of systems like SalesOft. Yeah. Well, and AI, getting back to sort of complete the circle, is... An avenue where, to your point, is a lot of this repetitious, repetitive stuff the AI can can handle in order to free up the sales rep to talk and have conversations with customers. Yeah, I mean, we, have, we haven't seen true AI in sales yet. The closest thing is this, um, like, you know, hey, I'm going to send my scheduling bot to, to get an appointment. on. You know, I mean, that, that's the closest thing to AI and enterprise sales right now. I mean, maybe like IBM's Watson stuff is doing sure. neat things and, you know, Google's got some stuff. But I mean, it, it is just so early right now. Uh, you know, I, I quite frankly prefer to not even think about it as artificial intelligence at this point in time and just think of it as accelerating process through analytics and data and, and uh, you know, and, and cadence steps, right? Um, yeah, which but, is what it uh, appears to be, quite frankly. Right. Yeah, and, and but you got a lot of you got a lot you got fifteen people talking about it for every you know potential example that I've ever seen and you know that exists in software <laughs> uh, and the stuff that is AI. I mean, it's dangerous, right? Like, what is the Amy uh, Amy dot XI? Right. Um, I mean, I can't use that product. Maybe, maybe one day I'll be able to, but I care too much about the people I'm connecting with to subject them to interact with that thing. Yeah, me too. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I, I'm always annoyed because I never have a straightforward response to it and it never handles it very well. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, Kyle, been great talking to you as always. Um, how can people find out more about SalesLoft and connect with you? Oh, just salesloft.com, but find me on LinkedIn as well. I've been pretty active there recently and would love to connect with you, understand things that you're going through from a sales organization perspective and see if I can be helpful in any way. And 
Uh, you know, love what you're doing, Andy. It's great for the industry. I know you could be spending your time doing so many things. And the fact that you're doing it, doing it here with this podcast is awesome. And uh, would you say you're up to how many, how many of these have you done? Over 400? We're hitting 500 pretty soon. By the time this airs, Man. by the time this airs, 500 will have, will oh, have aired. That is incredible work. You're like the James Brown of sales leadership. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> I not thought about that before. <laughs> it's awesome. Well, love guess, what you're doing. Your well, books are you. great. Your writing is incredible. And, uh, and now that you've really turned this podcast up, it's, um, it's, it's something that all salespeople should be subscribed to. Oh, good. Well, hey, I really appreciate the feedback and appreciate the kind words. And thank you again for joining. We'll have you on again uh, less than a year and a half between appearances like it was this time. So, well, I'll tell you, when we do, there'll be a lot more involvement in the AI world and we'll have, we'll have even more to speak about. It'll be less fluff and more reality. Excellent. Well, I look forward to it. All right, Kyle, thanks. Friends, thank you for spending this time with me today. Please come back tomorrow. We have another great episode lined up for you. Until then... Take that phone you're listening to this podcast on. Take a second on the app. Subscribe if you haven't done so already. Leave a review. Really want to hear from you what we can do to improve this experience for you. So thanks again for joining me. Till next time, this is Andy Paul. Good selling, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>